Well, good evening. Welcome, everybody. Um, I'm Judy Raper. I'm the Deputy Vice Chancellor for Research and Innovation. Um, and I'm really delighted to welcome you here to the University of Wollongong and to this seminar or public lecture on um, turning back the time on antimicrobial resistance. The Global Challenges Program has started at about four and a half years ago um, at the university to try to bring together researchers from different disciplines, from different faculties, to make an impact on the world's biggest problems. And the Global Challenges Program is, is running this two-day workshop on antimicrobial resistance. We've had a great day today with, with about 75 experts from different disciplines talking about what we can do to overcome the issue that you'll hear about tonight. Don't get too scared, but, but it's, it's um, going to be very interesting, I'm sure. Antibiotics have, been, have transformed human health and saved millions of lives, but their widespread use and misuse have led to sort of the unanticipated consequences and the emergence of antimicrobial resistant bacteria. And that's really a potentially big threat to society and to public health. So UOW is committed to addressing today's um, most pressing problems. And one of, one of the examples of our innovations in trying to do this is the Molecular Horizons facility that you, many of you will have heard about, I'm sure. It's an $80 million investment that will allow scientists and medical researchers to access the world's most modern microscopy. We will bring together the physicians who develop these powerful microscopes with the biologists who use them to study cells, with the chemists who can develop and the newest generation of drugs, and the medical practitioners who will treat patients. But you will hear tonight that such a molecular approach is only a piece of the puzzle. The puzzle is big and it needs many, many more people with different expertise and different backgrounds to solve it. The way people and societies behave is another important piece of the puzzle and we need to tackle this problem as a community. Tonight you will hear from one of Australia's leading experts on antimicrobial resistance, Professor John Idell from the University of Sydney and Westmead Hospital. He's an internationally renowned microbiologist and, and Professor Antoine Van Ooyen will introduce him a bit later. We will also have a panel discussion with leading researchers from UOW and experts from the Illawarra. So please save up your questions and, and talk freely at the end of um, Professor Idell's lecture. But before we hear from distinguished Professor Antoine Van Ooyen um, to introduce Professor Idell, I, I would like to acknowledge and pay my respects to the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, the Aluri, Wadi Wadi and Darawal peoples. I would like to pay my respects to the elders past, present and those of the future. And to, also I'd like to pay my respects to any indigenous people in the audience. I would like to now welcome Antoine to the stage. Good evening. Thank you all for coming here tonight on this cold evening. I will be uh, your host tonight. As Professor Raper told you, my name is Antoine Van Ooyen. What I do in my daily life is develop microscopy tools to look at tiny cells and tiny molecules and proteins and how they behave inside cells. Uh, today, um, I and together with a number of other people have stepped way outside of our comfort zones and have exchanged thoughts and ideas and discussed about a very complicated problem, that of antibiotic resistance. The way I see it, antibiotics have really become in our lives as something that we anticipate being there, being available, like we turn on the faucet every morning and we expect clean water coming out of it, like we switch on the, the lights and we expect to have power. We expect when we come down an infection to be able to go to the doctors and get prescribed antibiotics and miraculously within a few days we were better. 
be it coming down with strep throat or be it undergoing a surgical procedure and getting antibiotics to prevent infections from, from taking place. So we as a society have had access to antibiotics pretty much since 90 years or so, since Alexander Fleming 90 years ago discovered pen penicillin uh, by accident almost by having a, a mold in, in his, uh, his dishes with, with bacteria. And he received in 45, I believe, the Nobel Prize uh, for this work. And in 45, in his Nobel lecture, he already warned against uh, the danger of bacteria gaining resistance against these antibiotic compounds that we've been using to, to kill bacteria. In the decades after Fleming's discovery, we as a society, as scientists, have discovered many more antibiotics. And, and these have really changed our lives, changed how medicine is done. But we've also seen that bacteria have grown resistant to them. These compounds, these drug molecules, are not effective against bacteria anymore. And this problem has really become worse and worse over the last few years. And um, now there's a recognition, a broad recognition among scientists, amongst all members of community, federal government, policy makers, experts, that this is the time to act, that we really need to get our heads together and to think of solutions to this incredibly complicated problem. And as Professor Weber explained, today we've been discussing with a large number of experts from all over the country, coming from all kinds of different disciplines to think about this problem. This is not just a problem that can be solved by hard science alone. This is not a problem that can be solved by just inventing new antibiotic drugs or by inventing better diagnostic tools. This is a problem that we really have to think about as a community. We have to think as a community, you and I really, about how we use antibiotics when we go to the doctors with the sniffles, which may as well be a viral infection. Do we really need antibiotics? If it's a virus, antibiotics won't help you. Do we really need to make the smart decisions about when to use antibiotics? Because we know now as scientists, the more antibiotics we use, the larger the risk of bacteria becoming resistant against these antibiotics. So today we've had a really exciting day, I think, uh, discussing with all these experts uh, ways that we as a university, University of Wollongong, in the Illawarra, with all our high close connections to the regional and local healthcare networks and our medical research institute here on campus, how we can get together and start to formulate solutions or, or parts of, of the solution to this, to this big problem. Tonight, you will hear from one of the experts in Australia on this particular problem of antibiotic resistance, Professor John Iredell. Um, Professor Iredell is at the University of Sydney and Westmead Hospital. He's an infectious disease specialist, and he's one of those rare individuals who combine basic science hardcore research with the clinical experience. And this is really a valuable combination where he does the basic science, tries to understand why and how do bacteria gain resistance against antibiotic drugs and can actually apply this knowledge in his clinical experience and actually seeing in real life situations what works and what doesn't. So Professor Aradel has a, has a has had a fantastic career already with many awards. I think one thing to note is that he was last year uh, the president of the Australian Society for Microbiology. So this is the eminent society in this country with all the researchers, very smart people who think about bugs, bacteria, and antibiotic resistance. And I'm very happy to, uh, to welcome him here tonight uh, for him to tell us a bit more about this problem and what we can do about it. And please help me in uh, welcoming him. Uh, I'm looking forward to your, uh, to your story, John. Thank you, Antoine, and thank you to the University of Wollongong and Professor Raper for the invitation to come here and speak as part of the Global Challenges Program. Judy asked me before if I was going to open with a frightener, and so it's just for you, I've got the perfect slide. This is. <laughs> For those who haven't seen Nosferatu, Fritz Lang's famous movie about the vampires, this is waiting for the plague ships to arrive, bringing the next dreaded, in, the, in our context, antimicrobial resistance from overseas. The, um, 
the frightening story comes most easily and succinctly from Jim Neal's report in 2015. And I guess the take home message is that um, we're shifting or potentially shifting, if nothing changes, to a world in which um, our normal advances such as transplantation, big surgery, intensive care, all these sort of things are under threat from infections that ordinarily we'd be able to dismiss fairly effectively with antibiotics. The estimation from the O'Neill report was that antibiotic resistance is likely to result in more deaths than uh, cancer by 2050, so it will become our leading cause of death. Where are we in Australia? Well, I, uh, I heard from, um, in the meeting we had, um, today we heard that uh, Australia was one of those places that actually uses a bit more antibiotics than, than most countries. You can see we're on the right of this graph, but we're favoured with not too much resistance. And I think the reason I'm showing you this graph is twofold. Firstly, to see that there's a fairly linear relationship between the amount of antibiotics you use and the amount of antibiotic resistance that you have to subsequently endure, but also to point out that it's not a clean straight line. So there's a lot of variables in here and there's a lot of room for exploration and potentially manipulation of the system. There's no doubt that if you have a severe infection that resistance to the normal antibiotics that would be used first up has a direct impact on your chances of survival from it. And that impact is probably in most studies around twice. So in other words, if you present to the hospital with an infection and you have an antimicrobial resistant organism, you're twice as likely to die as a result of that infection. So the question I guess for us this evening is how do we get to this point and uh, then the other questions that I'll come to in due course is what are we up to now and where's it all going? So I think to start from the start, if you can just to gain a bit of perspective about the adaptation of bacteria, because really this is an adaptive story. If you accept that everything began around about four and a half billion years ago and that we first got what we would regard as recognisable life within about a billion years of that, the first organisms were much like bacteria, and indeed were bacteria, and survived in the absence of oxygen, but generated enough oxygen to cause what's commonly termed as the oxygen catastrophe, where you got to the point on the planet, the atmosphere had changed in such a way that all the microbes had to deal with this toxic oxygen species. So it's a huge adaptation required. And it wasn't until relatively late in the picture that eventually you got complex cells and eventually multicellular organisms. And in the last little tiny blink of time, we had animals, or at least reptiles. So in that last little tiny blink of archaeological time, if you extrapolate that out to about 20 million years and walk through that, it's only in the last couple of hundred thousand that we've had the anatomically modern human. And of course, the anatomically modern human was uh, followed by the uh, not very anatomically friendly factory and, of course, the antibiotic era. And the antibiotic era was, unsurprisingly, when you think of the fact that microbes have been adapting for billions of years to massive changes, that they would have little trouble in adapting to a few chemicals generated by humans in their factories. And in fact, every time a new antibiotic has appeared, usually within a few years, there's evident resistance to it in infections that we would look at. So it's been an inevitable consequence of exposure, adaptation, resistance. And that has really been the story to date. And certainly we have seen the human impact accelerate over the last little while. The uh, population on this planet went from about a billion to about two billion in the space from about 1800 to about 1930, which is about the inflection on this graph, and since then has taken off. And the intrusion of humans onto the planet has resulted in some major extinction events where more complex organisms, multicellular organisms, animals, have not adapted very well. The hunter-gatherers, largely uh, dealing, extinguishing with a lot of the large 
invertebrates, and about 10,000 years ago, agriculture and herding of animals resulting in a lot of destruction of habitat, and this is probably now experiencing the major extinction events. But in terms of the impact of humans generally, to paraphrase Donald Fr Rumsfeld, there's a lot of things that we still don't know. And I think it's probably fair to say there's a lot of things we actually don't want to know. And without making um, political connections with climate change, I will just um, make the simple point that the adaptive story of our impact on the planet, whether it be antibiotics, whether it be carbon, is um, something that we have to deal with. So what do we know? We know that bacteria adapt quickly to antibiotics. That's very plain from history. We know that that adaptation, and I'm going to come back to this because it's important, it's not the same as the adaptive model that I think most of us have grown up with and have in our head about the, you know, the accidental change that is successful and therefore becomes the new version of a particular species or type. We do know that without antibiotics, more people would die, certainly in our hospitals. We're quite dependent on this for our medical advances. And we think that if all antibiotics were to stop, that resistance would too. This is a, a something that you often hear, and I think it's fair to say that we're probably not quite sure about that one. There's no doubt that antibiotic resistance is ancient and certainly predates the exposure of antibiotics. And when you think about it, when you think about the fact that the microbes have had to compete with each other for turf for a long, long time, then the kind of substances that they might use to poison each other in simple competition would be the kind of things we might discover and say, hey, that's an antibiotic. Let's put it in a vial and give it to people. So of course, if you dig down deep into the bottom of the Yukon River, as was done some time ago, and you find uh, the microflora associated with a woolly mammoth or a bison, then you can find the antibiotic resistance genes in that gut microflora that are nearly identical to antibiotic resistance genes that we see now 25,000 years later circulating around in our hospitals. So the message here is that a lot of antibiotic resistance is not particularly new. Much of it is adapted from what has existed for a long time and some of it has been really unchanged completely. We also know that the story is not as simple as giving someone a tablet or giving someone an injection in a hospital. We know that it's to do with traces of antibiotics that are being produced and used in humans and in agriculture and in a variety of places that are not necessarily degraded. You know, as much as a third or a half of them may well end up in traces in our rivers, in our soils, to be reconsumed in our food chain. And um, we know that the kind of resistance that bacteria need to make to environmental toxins is not just to antibiotics, but to other environmental toxins, such as heavy metals, which commonly travel with them. But we do know that you can actually have a bit of an impact on this if you can control the use of antibiotics effectively. So one of the policy responses, for example, in most governments around the world, including in Australia, is to try and responsibly use antibiotics. And we can see just in, in large scale that countries that have really got no regula regulatory control over antibiotics that in countries like Australia we would try and preserve have seen runaway antimicrobial resistance. So it's clear that unregulated use of antibiotics is a bad thing and something that we need to manage. And it needs to be managed on a large policy scale. One of the questions then is whether you can do this inside your own environment. Can you sort of shut the doors and keep a clean backyard and um, you know, control it all locally? I think we don't need to think about that too hard. We all accept this as a global world. In a country like Australia, we have around about 25 million international passengers every year. Uh, sorry, two and a half million for our 25 million-ish sort of population. So that really the antimicrobial resistance that we see in a country like Australia is a direct reflection of the places that 
we visit and the antimicrobial resistance they see. So that the antimicrobial resistance that dominates here reflects our travel patterns, which are largely Asian, much more than European. And so the antibiotic resistance with genes we see here are mostly the Asian style antibiotic resistance genes. So they're different to North America, they're different to Europe, and there is some level of regionality around all this. And the reason I make this point is because we need to remember that humans are constantly sharing bacteria. It's on us, it's in us, and every time we touch surfaces, every time we touch each other, we're sharing microbes. I know it sounds a little bit gruesome, but it's actually part of a healthy planet. The problem is that if the healthy microbes we share are adapting to things that we have been wanting to save up to kill them, then we've kind of created a problem. And this is sort of where we are. So, what are we doing about this? Where is, what are we doing now? Where are we going with this? The current approach to antimicrobial resistance is to try and understand it better, because I think it's fair to say that we don't have a completely adequate picture of where it is, what it is, how it's spreading, how quickly it moves, and so that the epidemiological stuff, the descriptions, need to be improved. There's a lot being done, but probably a lot more to be done, and there are, there are many countries around the world, including Australia, starting to invest in actively understanding the scale of the problem and drilling down into the detail to understand its mechanisms of transmission at the population level. There's also a big call for uh, making a rapid uh, differentiation between the need to use an antibiotic and the, the ability to disregard it. So for example, if you turn up at the hospital with a high fever and you look unwell, one question you might ask is, do I have a, an infection that is going, an antibody's going to work for, or is it just a nasty flu? And so rapid testing is an important agenda. And these things can be basically summarised as better ways to understand and use the drugs we've got, which we've talked about a bit. Policy responses such as restrictions, we've sort of hinted at a bit, you know, if you can control the use of antibiotics in a country, you can see that you can reduce the pressure to adapt in the microbes and you will see a reduction in antimicrobial resistance. So the policy responses are very important. And finally, of course, there is an obviously a crucial link to academia, to industry, to discovering new approaches to this old problem, this, this uh, increasingly threatening problem, and to translate those discoveries into workable solutions. So the link between academia and industry is important and arguably something that we've not really done as well as we could in this country. But I want to point out one other thing, and that is that this is really about saving the old drugs, making new drugs, and ultimately it's still about standing on the problem. It's still about killing an ablative approach, stepping on the cockroach. But we know that if we can control the use of antibiotics, if we can minimise the use of antibiotics, we can probably reduce this problem. So we have a bit of a, a dynamic tension here between our natural response to kill these things that threaten us and the understanding that if we can't just back off a bit, we're going to be ultimately unable to deal with them. So public messages are very important, and we'd all be familiar with those, I think. Part of the message also is for the prescribers, the physicians, and this is part of the driver. This slide here is a, a, is simple, it's a simple numbers game from the Bureau of Statistics we have and the years don't quite match because I had to draw them from different sources. But the point to make here is that we do not currently capture infection-related deaths as a direct measure of cause of death in this country, nor in many other countries. In fact, there's a lot of work to try and establish this on the Global Burden of Disease Register going on right now. But if you do make the effort, you can see that sepsis, severe infection, kills more people than breast cancer and prostate cancer and AIDS combined. So if you present to the hospital with a severe infection, we know that the mortality rate is about one in three to one in four in hospital. That's 30 days. 
And of course, that means that antibiotic failure is a real threat. And it's in the minds of the physicians that you present to when you say, I'm terribly sick, I've got a raging fever, but the antibiotic consequences are not very tangible. They're not something that is experienced by you or by the physician. It's a downstream phenomenon. So you, again, you can see there's a real tension in the message. And it's understandable. When we see things we don't like, we just want to hit them with a spade, really. I mean, we're very intolerant of uh, you know, this kind of threat. And bacteria are treated much the same. And this is part of the problem. Because they're such a threat, because we're so worried about it, because we're worried that they might be resistant, we just go to the cupboard and we pick the biggest and meanest looking antibiotics we can find and we shove them in as hard and as fast as we can because we know that reduces the risk of death. But we also know in the back of our minds it increases the risk of death later. It's a bit of a problem. Part of the problem is that most severe infection comes through the emergency department. So it doesn't come from people who are in hospital who get sick. The majority comes from the community, de novo. Suddenly someone's crashing through the front door in a big hurry, desperately ill. And of course this drives the mindset in a department of people that we have trained to be quick thinkers. We don't want people to dither about whether to treat someone, whether to resuscitate someone whose heart has stopped, whether to get oxygen into their blood when they've stopped breathing, or whether to treat a serious infection with an antibiotic. So you can see where the drivers are. We also know that we are not very good at picking severe infection when it comes through the door. So this slide is, I'm sorry it's a little bit noisy, it shows a score that we very commonly use to decide how sick someone is. It's a scoring system. It's a, it's a rough predictor of mortality. It's a rough predictor of how sick you are. And the question is simply being asked, if we took all the people with the scoring system, could we give them a number and say, people with a number bigger than that are going to get into big trouble. We better give them the antibiotics. And people who've got a number less than that will say, oh, well, don't worry about it, we'll stick you in the ward. Well, when you do that, you find that about one in eight of the people who are stuck in the ward end up in the intensive care unit with a major organ failure. In other words, of that group that has a mortality of 25 to 30%, you will miss one in eight of them with our best currently available scoring system. Which means that we need to make these diagnoses earlier and faster because this is a time critical problem. So, where is it all going? I said before that bacteria don't adapt in the way that we think of these things, where you have a uh, serendipitous change that is expanded into a new life form. It's best illustrated by um, the story of the Gram stain. This is uh, Hans Christian Gram, who's a Danish microbiologist who noticed that if you stain bacteria that you can see under the microscope with crystal violet and then try and wash it out with alcohol, certain types of bugs hold it in their cell wall and others lose it because they have less of the stuff that you're trying to stain with it called peptidoglycan. The name's not important. The important point is there are fundamental structural differences in the cell wall that was discovered then in about the 1880s, 1890s, that we still use today as a fundamental distinction between them. And the reason that distinction is important is because the ones that look purple in this method, or blue in this method, are those with a simple, tough outer cell wall. And the archetypal example of this would be the golden staph, the staph aureus, the commonest cause of severe infection in humans. You've got this tough little thing all packed into the perfect shape of a sphere, and the opposite version of this, I guess, is the ones that live in places like our gut. And they're different because they have thin, flexible cell walls. They've got an extra outside layer, which is a bit lipid-like, a bit fatty to keep the water out. And they can put little holes in them and control all these holes. So you've got a way to sense the outside world in an aqueous environment without being at risk from it. It's the perfect environment to connect between your energy systems inside your cell, your protein-making machinery, 
and the outside world without being a threat from it, by closing and opening the gates in this outer layer. And that means that these organisms that live like that, which of course are all the organisms in our gut to a large extent, or a lot of the organisms in our gut, and a lot of the ones that cause severe disease in humans, these ones are all about communication, because they can. They've got the capacity to do this. And that little space between those two layers is where that sensing apparatus largely lives. And what it means is that bugs like E. coli, which live in our gut and cause a lot of infections, they cause the common urinary tract infection, they cause severe diarrheal diseases, they and their close relatives, like Klebsiella, cause about half of the severe life-threatening sepsis that we just spent the last few minutes talking about. These guys are all about sharing. So their adaptation to antibiotic pressure is to change the way they share stuff. Not necessarily to change their own makeup, just to change the way they share stuff. And they're all about sharing little packets of DNA, let's call them plasmids, that move between cells. And that group of moving packets of material is the determinant of the epidemiology of antibiotic resistance in those bugs. So just to come back again then, the story about Darwin's finches, the little accidental error that changes have become a success, that works for a simple organism that is not all about sharing. But a lot of the bugs that live in us that are responsible for half the lethal infections that we currently experience don't work like that, they work by sharing. And so the pressure on that pool of shared material, that's where the adaptation is occurring. That's an important distinction. I mentioned that it was important because half of the sepsis that kills people are these two. And this is another important point, and it goes to the diagnostics question, and that is that most of the infections that kill humans are caused by a tiny handful of bacteria. In fact, if you thought about all the bacteria that could kill a human, you'd have a list as long as, as, long as Antoine's arm. I was going to say my arm, but as long as Antoine's arm. But in fact, there's only three or four that completely dominate sepsis. And that means our focus on managing adaptations and on managing diagnostic needs to be on these. Two of them are the good old fashioned golden staff that causes boils, you know, skin cuts that go bad, that kind of thing. About 20% of it is the bugs that cause the bad sore throat or the bad pneumonia, the old man's friend, but the rest is stuff that's leaked out of your gut for one reason or another. So to come back to this issue about these guys that are um, adapted to sharing rather than changing themselves necessarily, they can be considered as an ecosystem in themselves. So if you think to yourself, well, I want to think about all my E. coli in my gut they have their own ecology, and the ecology is of this system of transmissible DNA, this transmissible genetic messages. Some of those messages contain antibiotic resistance, and so the question is how can we manage that flux to control this problem? Well, the answer is that there are winners and losers in every gene pool. So, you would predict, wouldn't you, from first principles, if I said to anyone in this room, I want you to design a system, we're going to call them bacteria, and we're going to say that they work by sharing information. And this information is a gene pool. The immediate thing you're going to say is, well, there's going to be competition in the gene pool. There's going to be winners, and there's going to be losers in that gene pool. And of course there are. So that adaptive system that these bacteria share have got winners and losers. And if you know the winners, you can go after them. You can track them, and you can potentially, if you understand them well enough, manipulate them. In terms of tracking them, this table shows the answer to the question that, that um, if you saw someone in severe sepsis coming into your emergency department, delivered by ambulance, being resuscitated, at risk of dying, and you knew they had one, <coughs> excuse me, you knew they had one of these four bugs because 85% of people do, and you wanted to target your um, uh, testing strategy to discover what it was, then can you predict this gene pool, given that it's this 
fluid gene pool. Who knows what's, what this particular E. coli has got in it because it's all about sharing. But I just said to you there are winners and losers. So if you know the pre-test probability, and in Australia that's around about 12%, so you're looking at about here, so that is to say that when that person walks in the door, there's about a 12% chance the E. coli that's in their blood that's trying to kill them has got a resistance. Now the question you want to ask is, I know the winners and I know the losers, what are my chances of picking it? Well, we've done that study at the bedside in the, in the bacteria that cause this infection, and these are the answer. So the negative predictive value, that is to say, the confidence with which you can say you don't need to use every ridiculous antibiotic you can think of, you can just use a bit of the sensible stuff that we would normally use, they're not going to be resistant. The confidence with which you can say that is something like 99.5% using the kind of tests that are available here and now and can be delivered on biotech platforms that are becoming available. So this is a tractable problem. And because you have winners and losers, you would similarly predict when I ask you this question about how this stuff's going to work in this kind of a system, which is all about sharing, you would say, well, those packets, those plasmids, those vehicles that carry stuff around between bacteria, there's got to be winners and losers amongst those. Of course there are. And you can manipulate them as well because they have ecological constraints inside bacteria. If you understand those, you understand the epidemiology of the winners and losers, you can manipulate this system. And you can actually, this has not been done in humans, but it's certainly been done in mice. You can take a mouse and eventually soon a human that has got one of these packets of antibiotic resistance circulating around in their gut that could turn up in their E. coli if it gets into their blood and you can selectively remove that without killing off the bacterial populations that it's in because you can manipulate these little packets. They have their Achilles heels and science is advanced enough to understand them sufficiently to manipulate it. So ultimately we want to get to the position where we are all a healthy ecosystem. So you need to think of your own gut as a garden. Some people's gardens are perhaps a bit more fragrant than other people's gardens, but nevertheless this is a way to think of yourself as healthy microflora. And so one of the questions that I get asked sometimes is, well, if my microflora is no good, if my bugs are no good, can I have someone else's instead? Does this actually work? You probably hear about this. It's a disgusting thing to do when you think about it, really. But the idea is that if your poo's no good, let's have someone else's instead because they don't have any problems in it. And you can actually do that. You can actually give humans someone else's poo and displace the badness that's in their own. So we've actually, believe this or not, when I was a trainee, this is decades ago, I actually did this, worked very well, and we do it to try and redress severe disturbances in the gut, to try and repopulate a healthy ecosystem. So it kind of makes sense intuitively. And the problem we've used it for is scenarios in which You've used a ton of antibiotics and you've really just totally wrecked the ecosystem. It's like you've taken napalm to a rainforest and so you've tried to re-establish it. It works well in that setting, but if you do that, one reasonable question is can you also get rid of your antibiotic resistance this way? So this is a sort of an accidental study where the question was asked, did the antibiotic resistance go away when I tried to fix the problem caused by you know, a ton of antibiotics in this patient's gut? And the short answer is yes, but it doesn't work terrifically well and you probably have to do a few goes and that kind of makes sense too because you're not going to have no bacteria in your gut so essentially what you're introducing is only competition and frankly it's not a very popular thing to do people actually don't really like this so let's come back to this story again about the differences between those things that adapt largely by themselves and those things that share stuff are there good bacteria and are there bad bacteria in amongst these things? And if there are good bacteria, can we leave them alone and just target the bad bacteria? So uh, there's a chap called um, Frederick Twart who was pictured here at the Royal Army, Army Medical Corps base in Salonika. Uh, so I tip my hat to the, to the work done in Greece. This was a year after he had published his discovery of something that he at that stage didn't understand but was filterable. Um, he was using porcelain filters, 
but seem to kill bacteria, just completely lies the bacterial colony. Um, it was subsequently realised that this was actually a virus, and this French-Canadian, rather adventurous character, Felix Durrell, independently discovered this virus, which we now call bacteriophages, viruses that eat bacteria, um, two years later, and he was really rather uh, more lauded for it than Frederick Twart, although he was first, he didn't really pursue it, the First World War kind of interrupted things. And history is kind of interesting here because it was about this time, so you've got the First World War, you've got the post-war cat catastrophe in Europe where really science was severely disabled. Um, you've got Stalin taking over at this stage, developing his five-year plan and the famous purges of the 30s. He recognised that this French-Canadian adventurer who had discovered these viruses that killed bacteria was actually doing a pretty good, good job with them and making a bit of noise about this. He'd been no, he was nominated for the famous Leeuwenhoek Prize and awarded that in 1925. This is a, a very prestigious award that is only made about every 10 years or so. Very famous list of names if you ever want to go through that prize list. So this was, um, this was a renowned discovery, the idea of a virus that could be used against bacteria but didn't seem to harm any humans. He was invited by Stalin to come over and establish this in Stalin's Russia at the point at which antibiotics were just coming onto the scene. So that in the first, in the 1941, as the Second World War is sort of gearing up, you've got the first trials of penicillin from uh, Flory and Chain and Fleming. And at that point, you've got um, Stalin's Russia re uh, rejecting the West the post-war Marshall Plan rejected the Iron Curtain coming down, the capitalist world developing antibiotics, and a true industrial revolution, modern pharma developing, and behind the Iron Curtain, the Farge story. And that was developed fairly steadily, but it really did not take hold at all in the West. It was completely eclipsed by the development of antibiotics. And Durrell eventually dies in Paris not long after the war, really a bit of a, a forgotten man. So how does this story work? It works as a simple predator-prey relationship. So this is an old system. Phages are probably the most numerous life form on the planet. They are certainly present with bacteria and probably outnumber them. And they have probably been present with bacteria since the beginning of that sort of protist evolution, long before multicell organisms, long before certainly animals evolved. And like all predator-prey relationships, it's a supply and demand relationship. However, these have evolved together, so the relationship's a little bit tricky. Because they've been living together for so long, it's not a simple predator-prey relationship. And in fact, many bacteriophages have got a much more commensal relationship with bacteria. So you have to use phages that are particularly aggressive. You have to be selective about the phages that you use. But the take home message is that you have a group of viruses that predate bacteria. That's all they do. And they simply consume all bacteria that are available to eat in the time that's available to them. And so there are a couple of mechanisms through which we might start to head back to a healthy microflora. And I want to wind up with the uh, summary, I guess, and this comes from the antimicrobial resistance site. This is the British report and part of the story that Jim Neal um, um, reported on in the UK. The key messages, I suppose, are public awareness, for people to understand that although this is a complex problem, we need not be totally nihilistic about it. Um, sanitation and hygiene is obviously very important. If we want to contain the spread of something we don't like, hand washing is not a big ask. Control of selection pressure is just common sense. There's also a need to develop the human capital. So initiatives like the Global Challenge at the University of Wollongong, where we're getting people together from all different uh, academic disciplines to tackle a complex multidisciplinary problem is the way forward. There's no doubt about it. Obviously, we need resources, so um, governments need to be behind this. 
but I think probably some of the exciting areas that we might turn ourselves to are the non-antibiotic alternatives. We need to understand what we're dealing with. We talked about that early on. We need to understand it as quickly as possible so that we can intervene effectively in time. And we do know enough about it to be able to do that. And we need to think about alternative approaches such as the, if you like, microbial husbandry initiatives that I've talked about a little bit. So I think I might stop at that point, Antoine, and try to end on a positive note. It sounds like a scary problem, but I don't think it's a total disaster yet. Thank you, John. Absolutely beautiful. A bit scary, but beautifully presented. So what I want to do now, before I open up the floor for questions, is invite a uh, number of additional people forward to form a little bit of a Q&A panel. So in, in spirit with the rest of the day we've had today, um, having several disciplines and expertises at the table here, so first I want to introduce uh, Spiros Miyaki, Associate Professor here at the University of Wollongong and Infectious Disease Specialist at Wollongong Hospital. I would like to invite Curtis Gregory, the uh, Regional Public Health Director of the Loire Shoalhaven Local Health District. And uh, last but certainly not least, Liesl McCoy, Clinical Services Specialist from NPS Medicine Wise, yeah, formerly known as National Prescribing Service, right? So, and, uh, together with, with, with John, Professor Iredell, I would like to, uh, to open up the, the floor for questions. And I think you should feel free as audience to ask questions on every topic use and the, uh, the associated consequences and problems. There's a person. Thank you so much. My question is, as a community, should we actually be thinking about our immunity, our individual immunity and our family's immune system, as well as our gut health, so that as an individual and as a family, we are consciously addressing this daily? There's no doubt that the gut flora inside us are a crucial organ system. They affect our immunity, modulate our immunity. Indeed, it's an important part of our development as an infant and then uh, through our early and adult lives. There's no doubt that dysfunction in that system has terrible consequences. So you're right, one of the key messages, and I hand this to you, one of the key messages that surely Look after yourself and look after your health. So yeah, there's also evidence that if you take an antibiotic today, you will have more resistant bacteria for up to six months, and that um, resistance will that resistant bacteria will also spread to people that you're close with, so for other family members, other children within the childcare centre, that kind of thing. There is, there is a little bit more the story. We should, we should be partners for our own health with our healthcare provider. Being a doctor, try to be a modern doctor that I discuss with my patients and I have the expectation of that they sort of command their own health, their partners in the decision that's for them. What do I want to say? Who has had antibiotics here? Everybody, right? Who has had antibiotics that we were not certain that they would benefit them? A lot of people. Did you, did you challenge that? Did you take a step back and say, discuss with your doctor to, you know, to ask the question? And I realize here in America how, on average, people are sort of a little bit more more conscious about their health issues, and unfortunately in Greece, where I come from, you know what's happening? If you go to a doctor with a, as a other extreme, but that's how it works. If you go to a doctor with a common cold and they don't give you antibiotics, 
and go to another doctor and get an as a good doctor. That mentality is no more than the changing now. But so I think one of the keys is that we sort of be careful and realize that this is a problem that affects everybody. Same as we don't smoke, we sort of challenge and pay attention to when and how and should we take antibiotics. Could you comment on the sort of mixed messages that we have in society at the moment? Because on the um, 10 points for preventing resistance, there's sanitation and hygiene. But at the same time, particularly in um, westernized countries, we have excessive use of um, hand sanitizers and other types of products that we are using um, for washing dishes, cleaning our hands. And there seems to be this disconnect because we're on the one hand saying that yes, sanitization is good, but then there are other studies suggesting that this over sanitization is affecting antimicrobial resistance and also potentially affecting things like um, food allergies, developments of things like that. So um, th there's Constantly, it seems, um, conflicting messages for the public. And, you know, is it, are, are we over-sanitizing and developing allergies? Or um, and is that part of our problem in our, in our Western world? Or um, is it more important to be more clean to prevent infection so we don't have sex? I guess with, um, in regards to sanitation and, and hygiene, um, we're not talking sterilisation, we're not talking complete removal. There's a minimum, uh, we're not going to remove all this. And I think it's acknowledging how we minimise that. So what we're looking at when we're talking about sanitation is providing the minimum basics of uh, clean water, safe food, things like that. So there's always going to be an incidental amount of And um, I guess that there's, gonna, there's also going to be individual variations. There's going to be people who for example, immunocompromised or have allergies that they're going to need to modify their behaviour. So what we're asking for is, I guess, a reasonable amount of hand sanitisation, a reasonable amount of protection, and getting the basics right and um, providing, I guess, people with the opportunity um, to, to live as healthy and, and take care of their health as much as possible. And I, the other competing message is there's a commercial message, and it's something that... Um, got to be tempered in and we've got to also help people think about um, their health in ways that make that, that them make informed choices. So um, you don't want OCD levels of hand cleaning but you do want hand cleaning before you know, you're eating or after you've used the bathroom and things like that. And I think that's a, I think we can get the basics down pat on those things without partying the water too much. So in regards to people, um, in, in regards to the information you've got, I guess one of the messages is Always be aware of where the source of information is coming from. Um, make sure it's a reputable source. And if you do have any queries, just use one of the many public health services that are available to bring up and clarify your questions. Could I ask a brief follow-up question uh, to get your opinion or clarification on the use of hand sanitizers that contain antimicrobials? If you have a look at the research, often it is the um, mechanical process of washing your hands that does as much to remove bacteria or the pathogens as anything else. And then you can use non-antimicrobials. Uh, Antimicrobials are often um, a commercial tag. They're not well regulated. There's not a, a standard that says this is what, this is what has to be, um, this is the minimum chemical component or something or active ingredient to be considered um, uh, antimicrobial. And then you look at things like, um, if you use a disinfection, uh, disinfectant that's it's alcohol based, it's a mechanical denaturation of the bacteria. It's not going to generate an antimicrobial response because it's having a, a chemical effect, a different type of effect. So you can look at things like that as well. I said before that antibiotics are a plastic environmental toxin. So too are uh, heavy metal, compounds, and of course, Bacteria adapt to these things as well. And in fact, the common ones among them, such as the ones we've mentioned, mercury, uh, ammonium compounds and antibiotic resistance often travel together, even in the same genetic packet. So 
kind of makes sense, it's kind of intuitive. Message about hygiene, though, largely relates to contexts in which you've got true disease outbreaks and you can contain them. So if you've got a cholera outbreak in Haiti, it's so important to be able to manage toilets and water and hand sanitation. Um, and maybe if you've got a toddler who climbs into your lap and says, oh, there it is, maybe that's a bit of a problem too. But the reality is that we're not spreading a lot of nasty germs in a country. Nasty germs not particularly prevalent. When we do come back from overseas, and this is a common story, when you do get exposed, you don't know, you're not sick or anything, you're just colonised. We know that takes months to clear. That probably happens by depression. So that you gradually incorporate the microbes that you live in and you essentially die with it. Started with. It is a mixed message and it is confusing. I guess the devil's Good evening. I understand that some of the anti resistant bacteria comes through food. But are there any types of food which are particularly um, high risk? Um, so the question was about food, how much of an issue is it? Um, is that right? Am I paraphrasing you incorrectly? So um, food preparations are actually are really quite a big deal. I'll, I'll tell you a terrible anecdote, um, if you promise not to repeat it. Um, the this, this story goes that a person that I met described um, her uncle who worked in a Chinese uh, piggery who contacted her because she was a microbiologist to ask for advice and said I've got this terrible problem I've, a lot of my piglets are dying and I didn't know what to do so I um, took some of the sick piglets and I ground them up and fed them to the sows in the hope that that would you know get them resistant to the, the bacteria that were making them sick. So you've got some pretty bizarre practices occurring in places where education about antibiotics and antibiotic resistance are not well understood and the regulations are not controlling them like they are in a country like Australia. But the next question is then how much of that are we exposed to? So if you look at the, and this is the slide that I made such a fuss about bringing up, this is the import and export data for Australia. So. If you look at the unprocessed foodstuffs, the very small minority of imports, we have a huge export-import uh, imbalance. So most of our unprocessed stuff goes out, very little of our unprocessed stuff comes in, and that's mostly vegetable-type processing. So in terms of seafoods and meat, which is arguably the highest risk group, that has been a bit of an issue, but is very steadily declining. So I think the regulators are aware of this, um, the Food Standards Authority is aware of this as an issue, and I'm not sure whether this is something that is on the radar in public health particularly, but it's certainly, it's certainly a policy issue that has been addressed, and I think reasonably effectively in Australia. But yes, you're right, food is very important. Yeah, do you want me to just add a little bit about public health? side of things. Um, it was originally we used to look after food as well. The fairly, uh, it, it was separated out into the food authority and they've got um, their own, there's a, a pretty good uh, mechanism in place for reporting food borne outbreaks and uh, following them up and also in uh, doing regular inspections of food shops. And it used to be based on what we called prescriptive elements which was, um, you know, did the floor have tiling, were the benches easily cleaned and things like that. But it's moved now to a real hazard-based approach. So what they're looking for are the key hazard points in the process and identifying them and then managing them. And that's actually led to a, a fairly significant improvement in terms of um, food quality and handling because it actually looks at where the, the risks are in the process rather than just looking at the phys physical side of things. So, and what it also does is then actually allows us to risk assess the food, risk assess the process. So. For lower risk foods, um, say salads, fruit and vegetables, there's going to be a different response. For high risk foods, there's going to be a different focus on where their key um, hazard points are and managing those key hazard points. And then we also do have a fairly robust system for following up foodborne outbreaks that are reported to us. We can actually um, follow those up in terms of the case, but also undertake environmental 
sampling to determine what the bug was and how extensive it was. And then we do do some serology around um, linking the cases to make sure that we can, uh, we've kept, we've, say for example, uh, there was a case where we had a couple of different cases, a couple of different patients with hysteria, and it was from a, um, the one shop, they ate different products. One was a cheese-based product, one was a poultry-based product. And because they were from the same shop, the natural assumption was that they were the same outbreak, and it turns out that they were two different outbreaks once we got uh, the serology. So it's important that we catch up the little details like that, and we do have the techniques provided we keep on top of it to be able to investigate. Uh, yes. Uh, what's, the, what's the contribution of industrial meat production on, um, to antibiotic antibiotics? And how will the advent of synthetic lab-grown meat um, contribute to minimising that source of antibiotic resistance? <laughs> That's a curly one. Um, so I think it's fair to say that in this country there's certainly been a fairly strong push, especially in recent times, to reduce antibiotic use in the food chain. And I think that's been pretty successful. Some of the antibiotics that we think are particularly troublesome, some of the classes that are important for humans, are really just not used at all. Um, certainly in one of our higher risk meat uh, supply chains, that is pork, there are many production facilities that really don't use antibiotics hardly ever and are really moving towards non-antibiotic solutions because they recognise the problem. The problem for the industry, the image problem if nothing else. So I think actually our food production is, is pretty good to be fair. And the food industry is very uh, cognizant of the risk. They're also very cognizant of the message to the public that um, they want their food to be safe and not perceived to be contaminated with antibiotics or antibiotic resistance. Having said all that, there is a little back door which is a little problematic, which you could probably tell us about. That is the, the use of um, veterinary prescribed antibodies, which has to be administered at herd level typically. So in fact there is a little bit of a problem with leakage of some of those kinds of antibodies. But I think generally it's not a major problem in this country, and it's certainly under close surveillance, but I'm really not particularly expert in this. There are a lot of NPS that really, that's really the sad stuff, isn't it? There was a second question, though, wasn't that? Was synthetic meats? Now, that's really way outside my expertise. As far as I understand it, that will be hellish expensive. It is expensive, and it would be treated just the same as any raw product. So the, the processing steps would aim to achieve the same reduction of risk throughout the process. If the process couldn't achieve that, then they'd modify to be able to meet the health and safety requirements. And, uh, there is another, um, I mean, there's another example in Poland, in one of the countries that uh, has the best records in antimicrobial resistance in hospitals, very well regulated, in judicious use of, of antibiotics by infections. However, they had problems in many years ago, not many years ago, uh, had problems, for example, with uh, resistance in poultry. And you wouldn't expect it would happen to the rest of families. Uh, what I want to say is that this is a bundle of measures. Like everything now in medicine, we say when you want to implement a strategy that's going to that gonna succeed, success, you need a bundle of measures. One measure itself won't be enough. For example, if you, have, if you are very successful in tackling antibiotic use by GPs, but the hospitals are overdoing it, or the other way around, or the vets are overdoing it, or, uh, you know, or there is uh, no tight regulation in, uh, in production, then it will pay. Or hand hygiene is faulty, for any reason it will pay. You need to have a bundle of measures. And this comes to the level of the politicians. Do we believe that our politicians do enough for antimicrobial uh, resistance? There was a, a very a very interesting move a few years ago, the Senate uh, welcomed some suggestions about the system, which is very encouraging, and I don't think it happens in other countries. But I think it 
central level, there is a lot to be done for antimicrobial resistance. And don't go far. How many advertisements do you see on the mass media about Awesome. Yes, but what I'm talking about when you see it on the telly and you see all this kind of stuff from <laughs> the different, you know, calls, wool horse, etc. I never come across something like, look, this is the problem. Just a 20, 20 second, 30 second spot to, to, to sensitize the lay public. Um, thank you for a um, very interesting discussion and thanks for having it, it raised as an issue. Um, I'm just wondering whether antibiotic resistance um, as a, a personal issue, and picking up on a, an earlier comment, um, has the profile that it should have in terms of preventive actions that people can take. So you've recently been talking about systems and getting the systems in place and so on, and that, that's great. Um, but some of the... Um, Competing messages, you know, processed foods might in some cases be safer, but they may not be the best sort of foods to build up a natural um, bacteria that is strengthening our, our health and our immune system because of the high levels of sugar and so on. So I'm just wondering if, if you could comment about how do we get um, this type of message onto the public agenda in terms of the steps that people can take to um, promote their health um, and um, tackle this, this as an issue and whether there, there's actually some competition with um, other areas like the focus on obesity to eat well rather than a focus on building up your immune system and well just wondering if there's um, some sorting out in the public health messages that we might need to be looking at. Like I've, I'll start this one again. Um, there's no substitute for good health. The personal things you can do are really basic, good hand hygiene, good sanitation. Um, like Spiros had said earlier, talk to your GP about medication that you're going to get. Um, do you really need it? What's it for? If, if they're prescribing you medication, just have a conversation with them around it. What are the alternatives? Are there things that you, you can do um, a little bit differently? A, a lot of, there's no competing me messages um, in regards to... There's different priorities, but the messages should be fairly consistent around um, good health and, and people's individual um, behaviour around good... or practice around good health. So. Um, from a public health perspective, I'm always going to say make sure you're fully vaccinated. Um, that's, prevention is a massive thing. Uh, prevention is fantastic because it reduces the burden of disease on the individual and on the community and, and your family and friends. And reducing the burden of um, disease on yourself makes, makes you healthier, makes you more able to, to fight exposure to infections. Uh, we're exposed to lots of different things all the time. It's when we're affected that we become ill. So let your body, give your body the best chance it can of, of um, promoting its own good health. And I think the, the, that's the picture. Um, the message as well in terms of um, your biota is if you eat well, um, if you eat in moderation, if you look after your health, if you exercise, um, things like that, you know, don't drink too much, don't smoke at all. Um, really basic, key basic mes messages and be healthy, you'll will build toward that as well. And you'll also manage the other incidental things like your heart health, like your obesity, your, um, your di type 2 diabetes risk. The good thing about, the good thing and the bad thing about health is it's synergistic. The more you um, gain in one area, it helps all areas. So that's, that's really something to look at. Yeah, when you're having some um, positive uh, health benefit, it's, it's going to improve your overall health as well. So. Yeah, the personal stuff is really, a lot of it's really simple and really messaging. Yes, my question is just about um, the evidence or the research surrounding the use of probiotics and their efficacy and if uh, medical practitioners should prescribe those in conjunction with antibiotics and if we should be using those more. No, that's, that's a really good question. 
um, I often put up that, you know, that slide about poo transplant, just to illustrate how little we understand gut flora dynamics. Um, there's some good quality evidence in animal studies that probiotics can weight gain weanling pigs, for example, um, and they can have all the kinds of effects that you might expect if you had a good, healthy microflora in your gut. Limited evidence in humans that um, probiotics can do useful things for you, like help you get rid of an resistant organism. Um, why is this evidence so limited when it's such an easy question to ask? And I think I'd be interested in Russ, your take on this, but my take on this is that probiotics, like bacteriophages, have not been regulated by the Therapeutic Goods Administration. So there is no mandate on someone who produces a probiotic to demonstrate that it's okay. If I ran a probiotic company and I had a certain amount of money to spend, I'd say, spend it on marketing, don't spend it on efficacy because it's not going to increase sales. It's not going to keep ash. If I was running a company that um, ran, say, meat producing pigs, I would say, I want to know if I'm going to spend money on probiotics, so I actually might invest in the research. So paradoxically, I think we know a little bit more about the effect of good probiotics in animals because there's money than in humans isn't. The probiotics we get off the shelf at the supermarket are not required to prove efficacy. Probably a good idea. I think it is a good idea. Whether it's been executed correctly is really a moot point. I agree completely. It's a balance. It's all a balance. What the probiotics try to do is to sort of bring a little bit of balance, restore a little bit of balance that at the same time, the antibiotics disturb. So I wish we could have the correct you know, portion, portion, let's put it this way, the correct recipe. It's time we were given antibiotics. But it's, it's a difficult uh, challenge. It's a very, very difficult challenge to find the, the correct uh, proportion. And certainly, there is a lot of work that needs to be done. I, I, I agree. I mean, it's, we know more outside of research in humans than in research in humans. And this brings the question to another, to another example. I an excellent slide of John that how much research lags behind from what is needed to produce new antibiotics. We all know that we are running out of antibiotics. But come to the issues now. How can you easily invest on getting a antimicrobial Research, when you know that out of your, let's say, 20, 30 euros, might cost millions of dollars down the line in years, only one might ever be successful. Incentives, and at the end of the day, pharmaceutical companies are there for profit. So they need incentive, and that's again come to administrative level that it should be more, more non profit money that should be sort of sourced towards research, so that we get more research that we need desperately. I think that question and a couple of others we've had from the audience really nail on the head a bit, and that is that, you know, we probably knew, do need to take control a bit. I made the point about taking control of your own health, and there's no doubt that better, <clears throat> excuse me, understanding of what we're doing. There are opportunities to proactively manage our own systems a bit. I hope that probiotics will be There's enough demand for proof of efficacy to be delivered. Take your health to your own hands. Yeah. Um, so nowadays, pharmaceutical companies um, are bringing out antibiotics like all the time and it doesn't seem like they do enough research to um, ensure long-term resistance and it's just kind of exponentiating, exponentiating the problem. Um, how do you propose to tackle that? 
So that's a really interesting one for the regulators. At the moment, um, certainly our regulator, the Therapeutic Goods Administration, and the US regulator, the Federal Food and Drug Administration, do not require any evidence pertaining to the likelihood of developing antimicrobial resistance or causing dysfunction in the gut microbiome when an antibiotic is registered. So I think that if that is likely to, if that is something that we will be expecting or is perceived to be a market advantage, then that will be delivered. And I think it is something that will and, and must come. I'll just add, add to that. Um, it's a condition of registering an antibiotic in Australia now. It's a new regulation to have a risk management plan for any medicine that's approved for the TGA. And specifically for antibiotics, part of that risk management plan is about monitoring for resistance. So it is actually part of registering. For new drugs, if it's already on the market, you don't need a plan, but the new drugs do need a plan. Murray, I think that's monitoring for resistance to the target pathogens. It's not monitoring, monitoring for dysbiosis. You know, the sort of dysbiosis that I think we're talking about. Perhaps I've misread the question. So that on one hand, you can say, I want you to show that the product that you're giving me is not going to fail in six weeks. It's going to generate a whole bunch of super resistance. And I think that's actually required. We must monitor for resistance. But if the question is, can you identify whether this drug is one of the drugs that will upset your ecosystem as opposed to the ones less likely to? That is not required. In fact, that's a difficult question. But I think it should be required. Will in the future. And I think some of that work starts before the drug's approved. Um, but the other thing is, in the development, you just can't get enough exposures until the drug's on the market, until you're used in hundreds and thousands of people over many, many years. Um, it's just it's impossible to, to simulate all of those scenarios as well. We take issue with that. But we, won't, we won't keep a running argument. <laughs> Great. Catch so, you afterwards, Murray. <laughs> so so this, is, this, this is really what the scientific debate should be like, right? So, uh, so people duking it out intellectually. So I would like to propose bring these proceedings to a close, but not before thanking, um, giving a big round of applause for our speaker and our three panel members. And of course, thank you for being here tonight and for all your fantastic questions and, uh, and engagement. Thank you so much and hope to see you soon here again for our next lecture. Thank you. <laughs>